Before I get started on the main subject about vehicle charging, I just want to digress for a second. It never ceases to amaze me the bloody fantastic places we can get to and we stay for free. This is a very simple little camping area which is owned by the municipality but it's in the extremely pretty uh, hilltop town of Montserrat in Portugal and there's an added bonus when I went out for my uh, simple dinner last night had a free evening's music th uh, thrown in. Life on the road is good and I heartily recommend it to anyone who can do it. Now very recently a highly experienced overland traveller published a video on his approach to his battery setup and his charging system. And the way he does it is rather different to mine, so I felt motivated to do this video to give an alternative approach. Now the way he does it, and I fully understand it, he goes with simplicity and reliability. He has two 55 amp hour yellow top optimers. He's got a standard alternator with standard voltage regulator. And he's got a simple heavy duty relay uh, for the, the dual charging system. Basically it connects the two batteries when the engine is running. Now that approach works for him, but it doesn't work for me. So why wouldn't his approach work for me? Well, firstly, the alternator. My alternator has to have an external charge controller. Uh, it doesn't have one built in. And if you're going to have an external charge controller, you'd be foolish not to go for a smart charge controller, which is going to give you much faster charging. Secondly, his auxiliary battery, 55 amp hours, for me is way too small. Mine's a 110 amp hour unit. Now, as a rule of thumb, you can use up to about half of that, although that's probably pushing it a bit, and if you're regularly drawing it down by 50%, I think you are going to shorten the life quite a bit, you're probably better off sticking to about 30% of the rated capacity. And I find that I easily use that up overnight, running the fridge and one to other bits and bobs. So I do need to have a much bigger auxiliary battery. Next difference, I don't use a split charge relay, I use a solid state unit, which is basically just a couple of heavy duty diodes, which keep the two batteries separate, although any current which is generated by the alternator is allowed to go through the diode and to whichever battery has the greatest need. Right, let's hold it right there. I'm introducing ever more topics and we're getting into deeper water and I think we need to understand what's really going on with the charging system. If you're not interested in the technical side, then jump to the next video and I'll show you what I did and why I did it. If you are interested in the technical side, then stick right here. Now before we go any further, let's look at what's happening on the charging side and I'll attempt to explain this as best I can as a non-expert in this field. I'm going to consider a typical multi-stage uh, charging scheme such as you'd get from a modern day alternator or mains battery charger. It doesn't matter which. And in this graph, I show two lines. Firstly, voltage against time, and secondly, current against time. And the charging is typically broken up into three phases. First one called bulk, then absorption, and then float charging. I'm assuming that the battery is fairly depleted, maybe, say, 60% state of charge. And the initial phase of bulk charging is carried out at constant current. We can't put constant voltage across the terminals because the current drawn is likely to be too great. And the current here is calculated so as not to damage the battery. And this phase is uh, quite quick and we move from the initial state of charge up to 80, maybe 85% state of charge. And you'll notice as the state of charge goes up, the battery voltage goes up. We cannot continue at this uh, current level because we would break through the gassing voltage and we would cause permanent damage to the battery. The absorption phase takes us from 80-85% um, state of charge through to 100% state of charge and it can take quite a long time. And this is done at constant voltage 
and the applied voltage is set just below the gassing voltage and you'll notice that the current drawn declines steadily until we get to 100% state of charge. We then switch over to uh, float charging which is like a trickle maintenance type of charge. This again is under uh, constant voltage so we drop from maybe 14.4 volts down to 13.9 volts. The current drawn is constant and at a fairly low level. So let's now look at the dual battery charging situation. And we take a typical scenario, we parked overnight, the auxiliary battery has been working hard, and in the morning, maybe say 65% state of charge. We do the first start up in the morning, start a battery will still be at a high state of charge maybe 95 percent and to simplify it i've taken out the current curves and i showed the two voltage curves here for the starter battery and there for the auxiliary battery now soon after start up starter battery immediately wants to go to the absorption charging profile um, with a charge voltage of say 14.4 volts but this is way too much for the auxiliary battery, which is at a low state of charge. And if you put that voltage across the terminals, it's going to draw far too high a current. As we move on, the starter battery soon wants to drop down to the float voltage, but the auxiliary battery then wants the uh, absorption voltage, 14.4 volts compared to 13.9 volts. And this voltage is far too high for the starter battery when it's fully charged and you're likely to damage it. On the other hand, if we hold the voltage back to the float level, it means that the auxiliary battery is going to be undercharging dur during the absorption phase. And the point I'm trying to make is that if we've just got a single charging source for both batteries, there is no ideal solution, and it's going to be an imperfect compromise for one battery or for the other. I'd now like to touch on acceptable charging currents for deep cycle batteries and you'll find quite a good if slightly wordy discussion on the smart gauge website at this uh, link here. Now the point is that there's no ideal charge rate for a battery. We can charge at a number of different rates. At the lower end we can charge at what we'd call 0.1c which means that for a 100 amp hour battery this would be at 10 amps. If we do this, the charging time is going to be very extended, but we are going to get very good battery life and could easily last maybe, say, 10 years. And this would be typical of what you might have uh, for solar charge batteries. At the upper end, we can go as high as 0.5C, which would be 50 amps for a 100 amp hour battery. Now, the point is, it's a trade-off. We get faster charging if we go in this direction and we get longer life if we go in this direction. A sensible compromise might be somewhere in the middle, maybe 0.3C, perhaps 0.4C, and this will give you reasonably fast charging and will also give you a good battery life. So is there any reason for installing a large alternator, maybe 100 or even 150 amps? Apart from the bragging rights, I can see only one possible reason. And if it's properly regulated, so we exceed neither the current nor the voltage limits, we are going to get very good reliability. You've got a large alternator operating at a fraction of its full capacity. If on the other hand it isn't properly regulated and you put out a huge charge, uh, maybe up to 150 amps, you are going to damage the batteries and quite probably the associated cabling too. So let's have a look at how some of the dual battery charging setups work in practice. Starting with the tried and tested voltage sensitive relay and an alternator with an integrated controller. Now when the engine stop, the relay is open, the two batteries are disconnected and there's no possibility of the auxiliary battery and its loads dragging down the main battery. But when the engine started, the relay closes and these two batteries are immediately connected in parallel and there's an immediate equalization of the volts across the two batteries and there will be some cross charging from the main battery to the auxiliary battery. Thereafter the performance purely depends on the way that the alternator is controlled and generally the controller will be matched to the requirements of the starter battery and it will probably go down to quite a low charging voltage 
maybe 14 volts, somewhere around that, at a fairly early stage. This is rather less than the auxiliary battery requires, but it will get fully charged, providing it's, uh, the engine's running for long enough. And so after a day's motoring, the whole setup will be completely charged. I'd now like to look at the other common setup, and here we've replaced the voltage sensitive relay with a diode based uh, split charge controller. And the two systems are really very similar, but with a couple of crucial differences. Firstly, here the two batteries can't communicate with each other and there can be no cross charging because each battery is on the wrong side of its respective diode. And secondly, there is a voltage drop across this unit. So between this point here and the output there and there, there's going to be a voltage drop. And it can be as low as 0.5 volts if the current's fairly low, or it can be in excess of a volt for higher currents. And these are really quite large numbers in terms of battery charging. Now when the, the alternator's running, it provides charge to the input of this unit. And thereafter, where the current goes depends purely on the potential difference between the output of the unit and the battery terminal on each side and also on the internal resistance in the respective batteries and you can calculate this by uh, simple ohm's law in simple terms the current is going to be split but it's going to tend to follow the path of less resistance now let's have a look at the problems which are caused by the voltage drop across the diodes this is incidentally a case study taken from the sterling power website and i give the link here and we have an alternator with an integrated controller. It's programmed to put out 14.2 volts. We get a bit of voltage drop here, maybe 0 0.1 volt. 0 0.4 volts across the diode, 0.1 volt here, which means that at the terminal to the main battery, we've now dropped to 13.6 volts. Now this isn't very high, but it will be sufficient to charge the battery eventually. However, the situation at the auxiliary battery is much worse. It's trying to draw a much higher current and hence we get a larger voltage drop across this diode. And the voltage at the terminal is down at 12.8 volts. And it's going to take forever to charge at this level. Remember that charging doesn't even start until we get to 12.5 volts. Now the final case I'm going to look at, we've still got an alternator with an integrated controller, but we've got a slightly more advanced unit here. And so we put in a battery sensoir between the alternator and the positive terminal on the auxiliary battery. Now it knows that we want 14.2 volts here and it increases the output voltage on the alternator until we get the desired voltage here, which is absolutely great for charging the auxiliary battery. But this does cause problems for the main battery. The main battery is fully charged. It takes no current and hence the voltage that we get here is almost the same as we've got at the charge controller. In other words, 15.2 volts. And this is a catastrophic voltage. It's going to cause gassing and permanent damage. And this does happen in practice. I've had this on my own dual battery charging system.